school dropout rates rise in South Africa. Following disruptions from COVID lockdowns, educators and nonprofits race to keep students in school. Processing cocoa in southern Nigeria rather than exporting cocoa. A new state-owned cocoa processing factory in Cross River State plans to produce organic chocolate and other consumables. Hello, thanks for tuning into the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Chang Balinuso at Channels Television here in Lagos. I'm joined by Vincent Makori from Voice of America in Washington. Thanks, I'm Vincent Makori at the Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Now, our broadcast still looks a little different because of the global pandemic, but we truly appreciate your staying with us on Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Chamberlain Oso in Lagos brings you that story. Exporting cocoa for processing abroad will soon be a thing of the past in Cross River State, southern Nigeria. And that's once the state-owned cocoa processing factory begins production for commercial purposes. The governor, Ben Ayede, who inspected the facility in Ecom, says the plan is to provide a better alternative to consumers by producing organic chocolates and other consumables. <laughs> Nigeria is the fourth largest producer of cocoa in the world, a position that shall naturally earn it a substantial share of the global cocoa industry, valued at $100 billion. In 2019, however, the nation generated $317.5 million from cocoa exports to countries like the Netherlands and others. Ironically, in the same period, the Netherlands generated more than times two, with $696 million from processing imported cocoa beans and exporting it as cocoa powder. Cross River State is determined to cross to this next level by establishing a cocoa processing factory in Ikom local government, an area known for cultivating and exporting large quantities of cocoa. To ensure the facility is ready for business, Governor Ben Ayade pays a visit as the staff here walk him through the chocolate making process. From tree to bar, Ecom Chocolate is expected to bring a new variety of made in Nigeria organic product to consumers. What is special about the Ecom cocoa is a special slight bitter taste. Now, most other cocos, chocolate. Cocoa products like chocolate, what you find is very sugary and very sweet, very fattening and very unhealthy. But the Ecom chocolate, our own chocolate brand, we try to use only the neem and get you the best of ingredients which contains that slight bitter taste. And that taste is an antioxidant which is particularly good for the body. And to ensure the smooth running of the factory, the state has engaged the services of experienced hands. The factory is actually set up to process um, cocoa, and in the process, they will generate cocoa butter, they will generate cocoa powder and cocoa liquor. What you're seeing here at the chocolate factory is just a small segment of it. The plan is to halt all cocoa export from the state and divert them to this location where the state hopes to get a bigger share of the global chocolate pie and create more jobs, thereby setting a good example for other cocoa-producing states to follow. Well, joining us now to shed light is Mr. Chris Agara, who is a consultant of cocoa and rice mill projects for Cross River State. Well, thank you for your time or for joining us on Africa 54. You, Let's start with this part. I mean, you must have done a lot of feasibility study. Tell us about the impact this is intended to have on the economy. Yeah, thank you for having me. I uh, want to first uh, appreciate uh, the fact that uh, uh, our governor has uh, shed uh, light uh, on uh, the cocoa processing industry that is uh, 
It's been established by his government in, in the ECOM across the state. Um, ECOM and the, uh, uh, the environment local government around it are cocoa producing uh, local government. And uh, we are aware that um, ECOM or Cross River State is the second highest uh, producer of cocoa in the country. And that uh, the cocoa from ECOM is uh, purely organic. And uh, so uh, our plan in the cocoa processing industry is to uh, do value addition uh, by uh, processing the cocoa for export. Mm -hmm. uh, our concept is to uh, uh, eliminate the, uh, uh, the situation where we export just cocoa beans without uh, adding any value to it. Uh, the, the, this is to ensure that uh, our cocoa uh, bring in better returns from, uh, than what's been done currently. So what is the uh, plan for, in terms of the targets now, for job creation, I mean, that's always a vital component of uh, governments and the citizenry. What is the government's estimation on that one? Yeah, there is, because um, when you uh, process cocoa uh, and uh, kind of establish the value chain for cocoa uh, processing, you will be uh, uh, engaging uh, uh, more hands. Uh, we, we are not just uh, farming the cocoa at this stage, we are also ensuring that uh, we create more uh, possibilities for the cocoa farmers to uh, make more money through value addition. And uh, uh, of course, the, uh, we have to ensure that uh, the return on investment by the cocoa farmers is better than what is presently uh, obtainable. Okay, we, we look forward to that. But thank you very much indeed for your time today. An agribusiness startup expert, African farmer Mongoji, says the factory is going to boost the interest of the investor and also other governments to do similar projects. However, he says it might not be impactful for small scale farmers. Well, um, the new factory would, uh, it's a welcome development. And um, yes, it will create employment. Uh, it would also encourage the development of the value chain of cocoa. Um, in the state, so it's a uh, it's a it's a good initiative in the right direction. So uh, at the moment, what other ways can we boost our agro industry in terms of how we can leverage on this one as well? Well, um, with the new factory, uh, it will generally boost uh, the confidence of investors, the confidence of uh, the indigenes of Cross River, um, and if it is if it is sustained in terms of sustainability built into it, um, it would uh, it has the potential of revolutionizing the agri value chain. And I say value chain, not just the sector, the value chain in, in the state and in the country, because other governors will see same and follow suit. Is there any? Um thing that you think smallholder farmers can leverage on in this regard and ensure they equally perhaps take their own farming to the next level? Well, um, that is where there's a little challenge. Um, most of the projects that governments um, do em uh, embark on is focused on commercial. The small scale farmers will just supply, get some increment in the payments, However, they don't, uh, they're not uh, well rewarded uh, because this factory is beautiful, but focusing on medium and small processing would have been ideal. That would have given like 50, 60% more revenue to the farmers, uh, to the cooperatives. However, it's, it's not a bad decision, but the rural farmers will not be getting as much as the processors to the distributors, but it's still a welcome development. So which one thing, if there were a policy that you'd like to see the authorities address 
to pro probably take care of this concern that you raised, what would that be? Well, I, I would say that um, part of the revenue, a portion of the revenue of the factory should be going to developing the farmers. In terms of, you will see all the farmers do, they use sticks to hit the cocoa. They need to, you know, backward integrate small equipment that will take up that drudgery from them. So the community also should benefit from the revenue, not just supply to the factories. All right, then, uh, African farmer Mogaji, thank you very much indeed for talking to us today. Thank you for having me. Chinese telecommunications giant Huawei says it wants to train up to 3 million African youth to work with digital technology, including cutting-edge technology such as artificial intelligence. But experts warn there could be potential negative impacts of China's growing tech influence in Africa. Timothy Obizu reports from Abuja. Yudu student Mohamed Mehaja will graduate from the Amadubelo University, Nigeria's Kaduna State, in roughly three months. He was one of a team of six from the school who represented Nigeria at the Huawei Global ICT competition in 2019 and finished in third place. Huawei introduced the competition in Africa six years ago with the stated aim of finding and teaching highly skilled ICT professionals. It says the competition has so far impacted an estimated 2,000 African students. We have been exposed to devices and the technologies we've never experienced before. Normally, on, a normal university student will not experience what we, we did experience in the competition. So I would say that this has made me to be much more IT inclined, so to say. The competition evaluates students' competence in network and cloud technology. Mehaja and his team's success in 2019 meant they were the best team in sub-Saharan Africa and that inspired many of the students like Hamza Atabo. I was inspired by, you know, when they talked about their stories, how they won the competition and also uh, give, uh, when they were giving their prices and everything, I just felt, okay, this is, this is actually something to... Uh, make sacrifice for. Students like Mehaja and Atabo are meeting Huawei's set objective, but critics say the company is a representation of China's accelerating presence in Africa's technology landscape. Huawei reportedly accounts for more than 70% of the continent's telecommunications network. ICT expert Samuel Adekola says China could use its competitive advantage for political ends. It's really dangerous. So I cannot uh, quantify how much they could go because whoever has uh, data, you can do a lot of things. Where you have, you have, whoever has data has a lot of information. With data, you can extract a lot of information about a, about, uh, a group of people, about the nation. Concerns about China's presence in Africa grew in 2019 after a U.S. newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, reported that Huawei had helped Ugandan and Zambian authorities spy on their opponents. Huawei denied the accusations and turned down requests for an interview for this story. Even as students like Mehaja and Atabo learn valuable skills, experts say Africa may have to pay a price for relying too heavily on foreign companies. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. To help children, especially girls, develop their interest in aviation, astronomy and STEM, that's science, technology, engineering and mathematics, a Ugandan mother has started the Supersonic Aviators Club in her home. Shamin Mwanaisha was bitten by the coding bug while helping her son, a young pilot, with his lessons. These are the steps we take to, to build a website. It's not your typical classroom. Three times a week, these students gather in their teacher's garden in Uganda's capital, Kampala, to learn how to code. Her aim is to train the next generation of Ugandan coders Shamim Wanaisha used her own savings to start a club, which mainly caters to underprivileged children who don't have access to equipment and internet. The classes are free of charge, and here 
Children as young as six can learn the fundamentals of coding. The system works in the way that we recruit ch children and we introduce them to STEM education using coding, space, aviation and climate change. Wanaisha was inspired to take up coding three years ago when her seven-year-old son expressed interest in aviation and coding. Despite the challenges of lockdowns and restrictions due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Wanaisha finds ways to keep the classes going and the children engaged and active especially when schools are closed. So can you go through this? Can you tell Africa is the world's last major on tapped market for internet access. Only 16% of its population use the internet, according to the International Telecommunication Union. Analysts say technological innovation is seen as a quick way to help promote lasting economic growth and development. With my passion in aviation and climate change, I hope that one day I'll be able to discover biofuels which planes can use instead of fossil fuels which damage the environment. Click the file on the code editor. Shamim has also taken the club's activities online with classes offered to anyone interested in coding. She also says she's looking for donors to help buy more laptops and equipment for her aviation and space programs. It's time now for a short break, and as we do, we remind you to visit our website, channelstv.com, for news and programming around the clock. You can also find us at youtube.com forward slash channelsweb. Still to come, the sound of a new generation in South Sudan. Rap artists voice their grievances amid the economic crisis and transition to democracy. Two and a half years ago, under the rule of Omar al-Bashir, this freedom did not exist. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. A new national study has found that South Africa's school dropout rate has tripled following disruptions to education brought on by the pandemic. Educators and nonprofits are now racing to intervene and encourage youth to re enroll. From Johannesburg, Linda Givetesh has more. Cabello Ramonye didn't return to his rural high school north of Pretoria when classrooms reopened after pandemic lockdowns. The 16-year-old got used to spending his days at home. With limited access to technology, online learning was impossible and he quickly fell behind. Child and youth care workers like Marie Van Royen, who provide support to students at his school, say he's among many who felt too discouraged to come back. It's hard for them to, to catch up. When I speak to the learners, they tell me that it's overwhelming. So some of them, they feel demotivated to, cope, to come back to school or to, go, to come to school also. They're saying it's too much work, yeah, because of the pandemic. A national study on the effects of the pandemic in South Africa found that 500,000 students dropped out of school by May this year. That's compared to 230,000 dropouts in 2018. Not completing high school has long-lasting effects. Experts say not graduating increases children's likelihood to join gangs, use drugs, be abused, or become pregnant. We know that learners who drop out of school before completing the final year of high school, known as matric here in South Africa, struggle to find decent jobs. Dropout isn't just the problem of the individual or the individual's family or community. Dropout is a problem that affects the country as a whole, as well as the economic health of the country. South Africa's Zero Dropout campaign says just one adult taking interest in a child's education can turn things around. The Isibindi Ezekuleni program is doing just that by providing 29 schools with child and youth care workers. Care providers offer students educational and social support in class, at home, and during lockdowns by phone. We also identify those who have dropped out, advocate for them at school, make sure that they are reintegrated, uh, given support in terms of catching up. We also help them with the transition to adulthood in terms of uh, assisting them in applying for, for tertiary and getting them into different programs. Romanye was among the students identified by the program. She's the one that told me that I must go back to the school. Yeah, that's why I, go, I, I did go back to the school. 
The Zero Dropout campaign and its partners are calling on the government to launch a nationwide strategy to re-enroll and retain students. They also want to see better attendance record keeping so schools can track and trace absenteeism to identify at-risk students before they drop out. Linda Giftash for VOA News, Johannesburg. Let's head now to Sudan to meet with a group of young rappers who are enjoying a new music stage thanks to the loosened controls in the country. Well, rap has come out of the shadows of longtime leader Omar al-Bashir's rule since his ouster more than two years ago, allowing youths to voice their grievances amid an economy crisis and a fragile transition to democracy. Two and a half years ago, this would have been more than dangerous. Mohab Kabashi and his crew regularly hit the streets of his hometown Khartoum for an expression of change as the music trope aims to popularize the Western genre that has seen a resurgence following Sudan's 2019 uprising. Nicknamed Mo3, Kabashi and his six-person group Idrat, meaning procedures, seeks to develop the rap music scene by composing songs reflective of society's problems about everything from difficult living conditions to relationship problems. My journey with rap started when I had been trying to express issues that were really bothering me. Problems at home, problems with my friends or my girlfriend. It then developed when people started to listen to the things I was working on and enjoyed it, specifically those in my generation. Idrat performs throughout the capital, criticizing police and complaining of economic conditions, making references to burning tires common during the revolution. We always write about our reality and the problems our people face, using simple words, simple phrases that can resonate with everyone, reaching the Sudanese in Khartoum to the Sudanese living abroad. He hopes their music can be used as a force for good. However, we have faith that when we supply our own generation with songs and issues in the form of music and art, these youth will be able to reach heights with any issue, no matter how complex or difficult it may be. They've had large shows that have become more common, with artists commanding crowds in the thousands in venues previously occupied by more traditional singers. The clandestine sea route from the coasts of Senegal to Spain is a dangerous voyage for thousands of migrants. For those who make it, what awaits them is a life outside the law and the stigma of being called an illegal immigrant. Jonathan Spire narrates this report from Alfonso Bieto in Barcelona. Many of those who survive the arduous sea journey to Spain find work selling fake copies of recognized name brand goods on the streets. It is an illegal trade, and they spend their days dodging the police. Advocates say the migrants' precarious status makes them vulnerable to exploitation. There's someone or several people there in the chain of corruption who are getting rich from it and are taking advantage, which is the most delicate part of it, of exploitation, and not only the exploitation of their work, but of humans. Some Senegalese migrants have come up with a unique way to address that situation. They formed an association four years ago to defend their rights and to comply with demands not to sell fake, knockoff items made in China. They created a brand called Top Manta to make original products. The latest, a sneaker. The product is 100% sustainable, made in Spain and Portugal with methods that reduce the carbon footprint. They say their brand provides an alternative to shoes made by large international corporations that they say are not as sensitive to the environment or supportive of local communities. They are exploiting the environment. They are exploiting workers. We are not considered legal, yet we are doing something legal. The shoes are labelled Andadem, which means walking together in Wolof, the Senegalese language spoken by many of Barcelona's sidewalk vendors. 
This shoe is contributing to the economy of this country. The cooperative has had the help of local companies and people like Sara, an award-winning designer in Barcelona. To me, it is an added value, the effort we have all made in coming up with a shoe that is ethical and well-made. Top Manta has helped 120 street vendors, known here as Manteros, or mantle vendors, to take their enterprise beyond their canvases spread on sidewalks. The brand's production and sales numbers are taking off and now employs 25 people. For Alfonso Beato in Barcelona, John Spear, VOA News. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCord in Washington. Channels Television has our last word from Lagos. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Remember, channelstv.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Chain Bell in Thank you for watching. Goodbye.